We are so pleased to be partnering with IDEO to present to you the Break and Make series. Um, this is a series of live conversations that gather New York's leading creators and thinkers for intimate talks in the areas of education, health, and money. Tonight's panel addresses health and wellness. And now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming tonight's moderator, Fred Dust, everybody. I actually want to start by just asking a question. How many people in the room have taken a soul cycle class? Great, excellent. Um, how many people in the room have done Weight Watchers? Excellent, yeah. So we expect that there's actually going to be quite a bit of fandom in the audience. And actually, to be honest, one of the reasons we actually wanted to assemble this, fan this uh, panel is because we ourselves are fans of both these organizations. Um, just a little bit of background on Break and Make. The idea behind the series is to really get people who are disrupting industries, not just industries, but things in our lives. How are we thinking about health? How are we thinking about money? What are we thinking about love? Other things, and who's kind of really kind of cracking the system and doing new things? Actually, in the world of health, it's actually pretty often when you ask about disruption, people go to things like the Nike fuel ban or technology systems. We think some of the most interesting disruption is happening in the space in New York around kind of community building. And we actually think that what we have here on stage tonight are some of the most interesting kind of compelling disruptors in the space of kind of thinking about health and wellness and community and doing those together and kind of having them uh, embody, embody that spirit. Just before we were kind of coming up here, somebody was talking about doing Weight Watchers together and how powerful that is and how different it is from doing it in other kind of systems. So that's what we want to discuss this evening. Um, just a quick introduction of the panelists and then I'm going to have them kind of introduce themselves in a kind of quick round robin. Um, but Elizabeth and Julie are the founders of SoulCycle. Um, when I moved to New York from LA, actually you couldn't go anywhere without hearing about SoulCycle. There was actually arguments over dinner around it. It just kind of came up all the time. I live in Tribeca, I walked past you all the time. I ended up doing it and suddenly found myself in these kind of dark, really, um, catalytic classes where often I'd find myself crying at the end of the class. And it was just an amazing experience. And I'm sure many of you have cried at SoulCycle. And so we've been a fan of yours for, um, for at least the last few years that I've been here. We're really excited to have you. And Dave Kirchhoff, I think um, for us at IDEO, Weight Watchers has been kind of a, a really fascinating commercial brand. Who in the world asks you to deprive yourselves or change your behaviors or do things that you actually don't want to do, but do it and then still kind of gets and garners the kind of love that Weight Watchers gets. Um, one of the things I love is that you mention them as a brand and somebody will tell you a story immediately in a room about how they've actually kind of been transformed by it. Um, it's really a remarkable brand around kind of health and behavior change. And I think actually, Dave, um, though not the founder, I think that you have like a tremendous commitment and in some ways are like, I think the passionate voice behind actually where Weight Watchers is right now. So I'm really curious to hear from you about the things that you're doing. Um, so with that, I'm gonna actually immediately go to the panelists and I may start with you, Dave, to kind of talk a little bit about what you're doing now um, with Weight Watchers, what you're sort of seeing and actually what personally has kind of inspired you to do what you're doing? Like why, why are you engaged with this brand and business? And I'm gonna pass the same question off to um, Julian Elizabeth as well. Like why is a dude working at Weight <laughs> yeah, Watchers? I say that, but it's like I'm, I'm curious if, if you are. It's a fair question. Yeah. Um, no, I was, I, was, I was saying earlier uh, that my, my introduction to Weight Watchers uh, happened just through sort of kind of dumb luck a little bit, which is uh, Weight Watchers was, was part of Heinz. Uh, it had just been sold uh, to a European investment company uh, that the very first thing they did when they bought Weight Watchers was they created a separate company called Weight Watchers Online uh, Incorporated, WeightWatchers.com, Inc., uh, and they were recruiting a team of people, uh, and I was one. And a, a friend of mine was actually interviewing for one of the jobs, and you know he and I would kind of brainstorm about what Weight Watchers might be like online. And then one day he called me up and he said, "Listen, uh, he was living in D.C. The company's up in New York." He said, "I can't take this job. Are you interested?" I said, "Yes," and I came to Weight Watchers. But there was something else going on, which was I was also 
a heavier guy. Uh, in fact, uh, I had had a physical one year prior to that, and, uh, and I had been blowing off my annual physical for very effectively for about seven years. Uh, and I walked in, and I had a doctor who said, your cholesterol is 270, uh, and uh, you've got a BMI 30 plus, that makes you clinically obese, which was just all sorts of sad stuff to have to hear uh, at a relatively tender age, and the suggestion was I was gonna have to go on statins, uh, which really freaked me out because my dad was on statins. Like, so that's like an old person drug. Uh, and here I was in my mid-30s and I was hearing this, and so the kind of the serendipity of Weight Watchers was that then I thought, like, wouldn't this be awesome as kind of a perk? I could actually lose this weight if I joined this company, so I started going to meetings, uh, and I was one of, like, you know, the two guys going to the meeting that I went to, uh, which was in a synagogue off of uh, 30th or 36th. Uh, and I started going. Uh, and I remembered sitting in that meeting and sort of seeing, uh, you know, one of the women uh, who was there had lost like 100 pounds. And I remember hearing that thinking, and you know, everybody was really thrilled for her and she was talking about her experience. And all I could think of is, oh, holy crap, 100 pounds. Like, where do you even start with that? I mean, I kept thinking, like, if I were 100 pounds overweight, I just would become 200 pounds overweight because I would probably, like, throw in the towel. And yet this woman had gone through this process and had completely changed her life. And I tell people all the time that that was, like, my Kool-Aid consuming moment uh, when I became one of these sort of weird, irritating Weight Watcher zealot people. Uh, and But to me, that's, like, to, that's... That's the spark of kind of what the brand is and what the company is and what the organization is. I, I even hate using the word brand because it makes it sound kind of cheesy and commercial because to me it feels like kind of this very mission-driven, nonprofit almost kind of place that happens to also be a good business. Yeah. So that was my entry point. Ironically, as part of the dot-com team, but I ended up losing my weight by actually participating in group support, which not a lot of guys did. Not that many do now, but we're seeing more of them. Uh, and now we're kind of going to this place more and more. The other interesting thing about that story very quickly was that because of the way it was started with the internet being a separate business, we actually had to make the internet a decent business. Uh, and it ended up, Weight Watchers Online ended up becoming kind of a big thing. Uh, so then Weight Watchers International, long story short, they bought WeightWatchers.com but when they did it, basically what they were doing was they were acquiring an already existing 200-person software company. Uh, and it was this sort of strange confluence of events where you had kind of a dot-com startup technology company, because the 200 people were all basically software developers, designers, content folks, being merged with this very kind of grassroots group support, collecting $10 bills in green tin boxes kind of place, and sort of bringing those two elements together which ended up creating this kind of very interesting intersection of where technology and group support come together. That's great. I want to come back at some point to the brand question, but we'll do that maybe after. I'd love to hear the, just your story. Like, how did you, how did you get to where you are? The truth is, Elizabeth and I really were each separately looking for an exercise for ourselves. We really created SoulCycle for us. We were the consumer. We were each out there in New York City seeking some sort of an exercise that we could feel passionately about. Both of us had lived in different, you know, we call them lifestyle, sta lifestyle states, but I had lived in California for a decade, Elizabeth had lived in Colorado, and exercise had really become part of a lifestyle. It had gone from being something, I had always exercised my whole life, but when I moved to LA, it really became something that wasn't just a chore anymore. I kind of had my aha moment when I realized it was more fun to go hiking with my friends because the weather was always nice than it was to go drinking with my friends. And so it just it was a really, really different way of thinking about exercise and it was making it joyful in your life. Cut to, I moved back to New York City a decade later and I'm looking all over for something that feels not just like a chore, not just like a way to cross out, okay, burnt my 500 calories, but the type of experience that I was used to giving myself, stress releasing, joyful, in the sun, hiking up a mountain, you know, picturing something beautiful, you know, giving myself a real, it was a luxury actually. Mm -hmm. And I searched all over New York City for it. I mean, there was no, at the time I was, didn't have children and I had time and, you know, I could afford a good class and I tried everything and there was really no experience in New York that gave me what I had found in LA. And 
it was really fortunate. Elizabeth and I were kind of introduced. It was, it was the, we always say it was the best blind date that we'd ever been on. We were out there separately in New York, sort of experience hunting for some sort of a fitness that we could really love. And we met at a lunch, and truthfully, we met in late January, and we opened our doors in late April. And it was kind of one of those things we always say, SoulCycle was just definitely supposed to be born because we were introduced and really the energy just never stopped right. and it still really hasn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's still going on today. Yeah, it feels like, I mean, it's actually really interesting because in some ways your founding story is actually not dissimilar to the fact, the way your founding story is. I mean, it's actually, in a sense, the brand was built by a woman who basically wanted to build something for herself and felt like she needed to like build something that actually worked. And I think there's something really interesting there. I want to kind of go back to this notion of whether you're a brand. You know, it's like I think when you're in, I mean, and actually I really would love to kind of have you guys ch start with that in a sense because I mean you're in an emergent state. So you as a brand versus you as a passion or as a mission. I'm just curious, like how do you think about yourselves as you kind of go out in the world? Well, we've been kind of faking it as a brand for a while so that we could pretend to legitimize ourselves. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember when uh, a friend of mine was walking, we had just opened our second studio out in the Hamptons, and he was walking up the steps and he was talking about, he's a very successful ad guy, and he was talking about Soul Cycle is just another, you know, it's just a fitness class or what. I was like, you are absolutely incorrect. It is a brand. And he was like, well, excuse me. Um, but I think that it just really, it, I think it speaks to the commitment that I think Julie and I like felt when we very first met about how the intersection of fitness and lifestyle together, the community aspect of it, the way that people interact, it could sort of transcend what people had seen in fitness up until now. Yeah. And so to that end, I think it does get to be a little bit defined as a brand now, right. even though we totally have been faking it, but it's nice to see some things work out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of um, fake it long enough and everybody yeah. buys it, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think, I think, you know, just some of the decisions that we made along the road, whether it was from a branding perspective, whether it was from, I mean, I don't know, how would you? If, you know, it feels like there's a real micro and then a real macro. macro right. Yeah, always. On the micro level, we always say, you know, as many soul cycles as we build, we still want everybody to feel like their soul cycle is the soul cycle. Mm -hmm. So when you walk in, you know, that community is the only community that exists. I mean, it's your place and that's where it is. And that's kind of the micro. And then on the macro, you really want to make sure that the brand is delivering the message that you want people to recognize it for. Mm -hmm. And so it's- And it's, that's in the experience of being in there. Right. Yeah, so there's a real duality going on. And you know, I think like, just like with Weight Watchers, you really want to keep what's going on inside the room and the meeting personal, right. but you also want to make sure that it stands for something in the, right. in the bigger picture as well. Yeah. And well, so actually what I would say is I remember uh, I was taken, I was, uh, my wife and I were out in the Hamptons uh, visiting a friend of ours, who you know, Meredith, uh, and she said, I got to take you to this place. It's like Saturday. And, and I have never really spent time in the Hamptons, and it's just, I still think it's like such a bizarre, freaky place. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> because, and she took me to this place that looked like a barn or something, and it was like, it was, it was Soul Cycle. And so, like, there I am, and I had done spinning classes. It just was different. And, and the point I was going to make about, about a brand is that I think you could look at something like Soul Cycle from the outside and say, yeah, the graphics are cool, and they do a great job with apparel and this and that, and all that stuff is true, but. To me, what really clearly defines SoulCycle is the experience of going, the, you know, the sort of insanely energetic instructor, the great music, these sort of bizarrely competitive and passionate women that all seem to go there, right. uh, and sort of this whole vibe and experience that you get is like, that's not like a normal spinning class. And so when I think of the brand, the SoulCycle brand, I think of it first and foremost as the experience itself and everything else kind of hangs off of it. But it's sort of, to me, that's what the name represents, mm -hmm. is the experience I associate with it. And, and obviously, you know, at our best moments at Weight Watchers, it's, it's exactly the same thing. It's right. sort of, it, sure. it, 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 at its best, it should represent this organization where I spend time with, you know, with a Weight Watchers leader who's running one of these group support meetings. She lost her weight on Weight Watchers. I've met women and men who, who run Weight Watchers meetings. Some of them are stay-at-home moms. Some of them, like, there's, I know one guy who's a law professor at, Boston University. Uh, I've met corporate attorneys, I've met doctors, I've met all these people that are doing it significantly for the passion of delivering experience, helping other people because they just believe so strongly in it. And at our best, 
we do things to encourage that and build on it because that is the brand is yeah. that experience that feeling that that feeling of you know support and caring and everything else that makes a difference uh, for so many people of either having success or not mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we really focus on. It's funny that you say that. It's the, human, the humanity of it, the human experience of what's going on there that then sort of ends up defining the culture and defines the vision, the, the brand later. But I do think that that is, I mean, that's the key component of how these communities sort of take on a life of their own that you don't even you know, set out to do necessarily. But it's the momentum of and the passion that people experience in there and what they get out of it that is what we get out of it. So we're excited that other people are getting out of it, just like you. Well, it's actually really interesting because you're both hitting on this notion of that there's something aspirational about being in the group and actually even the idea of going towards group leader. If you think about it, like actually in your world, it's like you might, I mean, you might have a psycho service getting called out to be in the front of the studio like, like while they're doing it or become, you know, a, a teachers themselves. Likewise, a lot of people, your people go on to become group leaders. And so I'm really curious to know, like, how conscious of that are you in terms of kind of like as you're building the system? Like, it's like, do you think about actually how you're bringing people up into it? And then actually, like, where, where are they going? I mean, how are you kind of building in that, that in, like, are you building community into the, into the, into the very experience as you start. I'm just curious. Well, and my guess is actually the stories are probably, probably incredibly similar with this as well, mm -hmm. which is, you know, when Weight Watchers was founded 50 years ago uh, by a woman named Jean Neidich in Queens, as if Fred, as you point out, mm -hmm. I mean, she basically was doing this to sort of help her, she and her friends, like they kind of wanted to deal with this weight issue mm -hmm. and they figured out that they could have more success doing it together. Mm -hmm. Uh, and kind of pushing each other along, particularly because they were all struggling with the same problem. And lo and behold, you know, pe more and more people started showing up. The next thing you know, somebody achieves great success and they become really passionate about it. And those were the people who ultimately were becoming leaders. So I could meet a leader today in, say, Los Angeles. Uh, she might be, I know a woman, she plays for the Los Angeles Philharmonic, she plays flute, she just, she's a brand new Weight Watchers leader, she's 25 years old. I could trace her lineage back to Jean Neidich. Mm -hmm. So she had a leader who had a leader who had a leader who had a leader all the way back to 19, the first meeting in 1961. The company was formed in 1963. So that's, that was, there was no other way. I mean, that's kind of literally <laughs> was, it, it wasn't a design decision. Right. It just was. So it's like a new use for Ancestry.com. You can basically exactly. trace the kind of expansion. Exactly. It's like, and I won't even go to the kind of like the, the connotations, the Mormonism or whatever. But it's like, but it feels like there's a really interesting kind That's of true. thing to pull off of there um, that, that I think is really intriguing. I, I guess it's like I'm really, um, I, I do want to kind of go back to the individual for a moment, and I'm going to kind of pull on you specifically, Julie, because I think there is a kind of factor here that's about. Um, uh, this notion of like obsession. How, when do you move habit to something that actually feels like it actually becomes kind of consistent and kind of engaging pretty much constantly? And you yourselves kind of mentioned that you're sort of obsessed with Weight Watchers. Um, and I'd love to hear like why and actually how I like, am. and what you can learn from it from what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, if you can I, tell, yeah. I so. actually am obsessed with Weight Watchers. I live my life on and off of Weight Watchers. I am a huge advocate of it. Um, it's funny, uh, Elizabeth and I have really made a very conscious decision that at SoulCycle, you know, we are not food experts, we are not nutritionists, we have made a real decision not to add any sort of a, a nutrition component to what we do with exercise. But when people do ask me personally, I always say, well, there's only one way to really do it, and that is Weight Watchers. What I think is amazing about Weight Watchers, and I think it's amazing about SoulCycle too, and you actually said it in the yeah. beginning, it's a behavioral change. Anybody can diet for a week. Anybody can drink juice. Anybody can have something delivered to them. But the thing is, when you go on Weight Watchers, you actually learn to convert in your head what a portion is. Yeah. It's when people say to me, how do you do it? It's the points. It's so hard. Ah, what's an apple? What's a thing? I always say, it's literally like going to a foreign country <coughs> for the first week trying to get around and get everything that you right. need. And then a month after you live there, you begin to think bilingually. Mm -hmm. And at this point in my life, it's like, I know what a portion is. I know what I can have in a day. I know if a day is not going to happen like that. And so then I know what to do the next day. And when you live like that, you, you can have a life. You mm -hmm. can gain two pounds and you can lose two pounds, but you're never going 20 to the left and 20 to the right because you always really understand 
how you can keep yourself. I'm a big control freak. So for me, <laughs> this may be a theme across the whole It's control. <laughs> it's it's absolutely control and there's there's no guessing. Right. It's really it's a math equation. Right. I it's there's no there's no question mark. Yeah. If you do it, it will work. Yeah. It is numbers, it is easy. You know, we were joking around before. I have a major sweet tooth. I know how many points Twizzlers are. And I know how many points junior mints are at the theater matinee. Right. And those are all figured into my day in life. I can happily eat them because I don't have to worry about it. I'm just going to yeah. you know, do yeah. whatever I'm going to do and skip this or that or right. make up for it the next day. But what I think is really key that you hit on is that you are changing your behavior. I think differently. I understand what a day in the life of food really means. And I can modify my life to do that. And I, it's consistent. I mean, I really live consistently. Soul cycles the same way. Right. With Soul Cycle, you know, Elizabeth said this early on. She said she doesn't want it to be an exercise class. She wants it to be a practice. Mm -hmm. And I think about that all the time. With Soul Cycle, it's it really becomes a part of your life. We've found a way to make exercise joyful. It becomes something that you look forward to. It's time that you give to yourself. And so as a result of it, it's you're consistent about it. People always say, "What do you think it is about Soul Cycle that makes it so effective?" Here's what's so effective: you don't hate coming back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't hate coming back, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> if you can do something, anything. I mean, it's not you know, it's not what we're doing in there is so different or magic. If you do anything four times a week consistently because it's really part of something that you like to do you're gonna look great. You could walk around the block four times a week. It would be great. Yeah. And so I think that's really what it is. I think the changing of behaviors is everything. And I think that really both brands do teach you how to understand that. I think that's really interesting. And I actually, I really love the metaphor of like bilingual. Cause I think in a sense, actually you both do that. I mean, definitely that's kind of the world you live in is kind of a bilingual world. I think you do that as well. In a sense that actually you kind of, you do have a specialized system, but do have a specialized experience. And actually there's a joy in participating in that, like in kind of feeling like you're a little bit privileged. And I guess I'd love to hit on that actually for both of you, which is that um, if you talk to um, somebody about Weight Watchers, or if you just mention Weight Watchers, somebody will say, oh, I did it you know, five years ago and I lost 20 pounds and I'm so thankful. I mean, like, everybody has sort of an experience around it. I think actually around Soul Cycle, there's often a, I wanna do it. I mean, there actually, there are people who actually aspire to do it to kind of, and, and not everybody feels like they're actually ready for it. And I'd love to kind of talk a little bit around the role of, exclusivity, openness, like it's like how does that play in building community because they're both really powerful tools and so I'd love to see like just how you thought about that a little bit if you've thought about that as you've been designing your system as well. It, you know it's an interesting question as I think about is I think about you know there's there's a huge amount of things that are similar between Weight Watchers and Soul Cycle, but there are also some things that honestly are also a little bit different which is when I think of Soul Cycle, it feels very aspirational to me Right, it's sort of like you imagine kind of the, if you can sort of imagine the prototypical soul cycle like habitual user, like this person just kicks so much tail like it's frightening. <laughs> like you're just, they're badasses, you know? And, it's, and, and, and there's something about right. exercise that's very aspirational. It may feel daunting. It may feel like it, it's gonna be hard or it's gonna be painful or it's gonna be a slog or whatever. So I'm not saying that there aren't negatives to overcome, but there's a thing which is if you go there and you're there all the time, you probably talk about it lots and lots. What's funny about Weight Watchers is that that's not true. Like you'll listen to people with uh, talk about Weight Watchers. So we have a new uh, spokesperson that we're working with who we happen to find because she was just tweeting at us, which is a woman named Anna Gasteyer uh, from Suburgatory and Saturday Night Live. And she's actually telling the story that she would like, people would find out she was doing Weight Watchers and they would say, well, because you know, they'd ask her what she was doing and she's like, oh, I'm doing Weight Watchers. And they would say, lo and behold, they would say, oh my God, me too. But shh. Uh, and, and I think the thing is, if you ask like, why is it that like, you would like rock some serious like Soul Cycle logos, whereas you don't see a ton of Weight Watchers logos on, on apparel, <laughs> and you might say Where's kind of bandanas? like, well, I'm what's waiting. the we can difference? Help you with that, that? For sure. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it is Something a typography. Of time. It, it could be the typography. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. um, <laughs> No, but what I'm seeing I, a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I would say is that one of our challenges is that people who struggle with weight feel badly about the fact that they struggle with weight. Like, no, they're not happy with it. And they, they feel worse because people make them feel worse and they feel pressure. And it's all this like negative stuff. And they feel like it's something that they're doing wrong that they got to this point in their life where they, they have this weight issue. 
And now on some level, they oftentimes will go through this, this place where they're like, God, am I really the sad person who needs to get help yeah. dealing with the weight issue? And what does that say about me? I mean, it's, it's tough stuff. Now, once they go and they discover it and they learn it, they're like, oh, it's, they'll, they'll usually say, it's so much better than I thought it was going to be. It really, it becomes simple. It makes sense. It's intuitive. They feel good about it. But it's this weird thing where exercise is aspirational. Dealing with a weight issue feels like punishment. And, and there's sort of, and we struggle with this all the time because once we get them in the door, we do a really good job of keeping them engaged and, and helping people. Our biggest challenge is getting people in the door. And so I, when you say exclusivity, it, it kind of isn't mm -hmm. that way. Uh, it, what it is, though, is that it is this little kind of subculture that comes out in unexpected places. And, uh, you know, I love it when I find out that, you know, people like Julie are successful members because I'm like, we're awesome uh, because <laughs> she's cool. And sort of by transitive property, that make makes us freeze. cool. Yeah, it's just like, nobody it's knows. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so how, do, how does that balance work? Because it feels like actually, I think that aspiration is a really big piece of what you do. And actually what is interesting about the classes, like, I mean, I was terrified the first one I went to. And actually, it isn't one type of person. You actually have a real variety of people in, in, in the, it's actually not necessarily what you'd imagine. And so I'm just, how have you thought about kind of keeping it exclusive? What's the value of it? Do you think of yourself as exclusive at all? I'm curious. I mean, I don't know what you think about it, but I, I really don't think of us yeah. as being exclusive. Like, I, to me, it's like a pay-per-class situation. So, like, I don't have to sign up for a long experience. If I don't like it, I don't have to come back. Mm -hmm. And I get out of it what I put into it. It's, you know, it's like Weight, weight Watchers in that way. If I put into it and I commit to the program, I'm going to get something out of it. And even if I only go once, I might get something out of it. So, for me, I never really looked at it that way. In fact, one of the things that I get, like most like upset about is when I feel like people are like, oh, I can't do it. You know, it's not for me. It's too many people who are, it's, you know, incredible <coughs> fitness fanatics and I could never be like that because that's not why we created SoulCycle. We created SoulCycle for people who don't feel like they can access fitness. They don't feel like they can access cardio. And we, can, we created it for people who are in phenomenal shape who want to push themselves even farther than they th thought they could on their own. So we're really, you know, Julie and I always joke that we're like the yin to each other's yang, but I feel like we sort of check the boxes of the you know, the A and the B characteristics, and it's really for everybody in that, in that way. So I, I don't like to think of it um, personally. I don't, I don't like to think well, of I it Well, I think you're way. actually both hitting on some really interesting things around community, which is that, there's that there are external perceptions around communities that happen when you actually see it from the outside versus what happens when you see it on the inside. Because I would say I had the same experience when I first went to a social cycle class. I imagined what it was like and then kind of saw that it was different. Same with Weight Watchers, actually. And so I think it's like how you break open the boundaries of kind of what it feels like to be in a class that people could see is a really interesting, I think, challenge around building communities of change a little bit. So I think there's really interesting things to play off of. I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience in about three minutes. I'm going to ask one last question for you all before we actually kind of open it up. Um, so think about whether you have questions or thoughts. But what I'd love to do, actually, is you're both familiar with each other's brands. Um, I'd love to kind of maybe get a notion of if you were going to be thinking about what SoulCycle would do next, what might you want SoulCycle to do? Likewise, if you had an idea, and I'm mm. sure, I know Julie's got like a ton of ideas. It's like, if you had hey, ideas. Hold, hold on, I brought a small <laughs> one. Yeah, <exactly. laughs> Aside from the shirt, but it's like, no, it's like, but it's like, if you were going to think about like where Weight Watchers could go and where you'd like, actually, what would it be? Or how could you imagine thinking about things together? I'm just curious, but maybe, because really, I think, Julie, you have like a list. I like just a, want more points. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> special wine points would be fantastic, actually. So it's like, but yeah. Uh, you want to start? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's 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 fun. The it's it's fun to be able to see an organization and a company like SoulCycle kind of at this stage of its development, because they're really kind of hitting their stride, and kind of like getting into that sweet spot of like there's it's. We were just talking beforehand, like it's, there's so much territory that for, for this, for SoulCycle to be introduced to. Uh, in so many places that, you know, it's sort of like, you can easily, like, I, I could literally go through the list of endless neighborhoods that I know for a fact, like it was weird, I was saying, like I just, I've just heard that they were in Greenwich, I didn't realize that, Greenwich, Connecticut. 
And somebody had told me that about a week ago, and I'm like, oh my God, I swear they must be killing it <laughs> in, in Greenwich, Connecticut. And in fact, they are killing it in <laughs> Greenwich, Connecticut. And there's a lot of that stuff going on. I think it, it just even doing what you're doing and just bringing it to more places is like you have more to do than you could ever possibly hope to imagine and sort of more growth and, and everything else. I think the, 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 the trick with all this stuff is going to be to sort of keep that kind of tightness and consistency. These, I mean, what makes SoulCycle SoulCycle is that their instructors are fantastic. Like that's kind of the big trick. And that's easy to say and hard to do. And you see this with organizations. I mean, this is what's your, your opening starting point with all this, by the way, which was interesting, which is everybody kind of imagines a world with apps and Facebook and kind of all this stuff and isn't this where the future is and why would anyone participate in any kind of community activity whatsoever? Right. And my, my, my first point with that is like, it's just gonna be a sad, sad world when we live in a place where we literally think of Facebook as a place how we, where we interact right. with humans. Um, <laughs> but what I would also tell you is that it is a weird thing to watch community and group at work. In fact, Charles is Duhigg, who is right. supposed to be here, isn't here, uh, did a really interesting study uh, of, you know, or referenced a lot of interesting work, which is why is it that after all these years, AA works pretty well uh, for alcohol dependency? And what he found is that if you talk about a behavior change process, uh, and it was interesting, listening to Julie talk earlier, she was saying, you know, I know with Weight Watchers, if I simply do it, it'll work. And if it, that's actually important. Mm -hmm. So here's what we found uh, in terms of what is, makes people succeed or not in a behavior change process. And this is kind of hard to hear, but it's true. Which is, if you believe, whatever your program is, that simply by sticking with the program and doing it, it will work, it will work. If you believe that you're probably going to fail, but you owe it to yourself to try, you'll probably fail. And the clinical term for that is called self-efficacy. Julie obviously has quite a bit of self-efficacy. Uh, and it's that confidence of knowing. But then you can ask the question of, well, what if I don't believe that? And I get that question a lot at, at Weight Watchers meetings when I'm having this, yeah. this talk. And that's group. And it's this, this, it isn't like kumbaya and feel good and everything else. It's actually grounded in a lot of sound clinical psychology, cognitive behavioral therapy, however you want to think about it, which is when you're around other people trying to believe the same thing, you, in fact, are more likely to believe it. It is why we have organized religion mm -hmm. at a very basic level. And so you sort of think about it and you think about the power of community and then when I think about Soul Cycle, again, it's sort of like that's kind of the thing and the person who's leading it and bringing this group and creating this, I don't know how to describe it, kind of crazy energy is what makes the brand the brand, the experience the experience. And so therefore, the trick is, is that with this huge landscape of opportunity that's in front, I think it feels like the real challenge is going to be when you go to Atlanta and Dallas and whatever the glitzy part of Des Moines, Iowa is, like, how do you keep the right. soul cycle thing going as it gets bigger and yeah. bigger? It's really interesting because I think the way you characterize community is like community is a belief, and I think you actually both do do that. I mean, that's kind of what you have as well. Is like you've built believing systems, people actually who kind of believe in each other and believe in what that can do. And I think it's a really powerful way to think about like unlocking community. Love thoughts, Weight Watchers. What would you love to see them do? Well, one thing I just wanted to say is it's funny to me people who do your program only online. I don't know if I'm just old. I mean, it's funny when you were talking about the transition of when you guys were acquired and online became, I remember many frustrating weeks where they couldn't find my thing online because the computer system was getting integrated into the, the meeting system or whatever. But you know, I was sort of there before online. And so for me, the thought of actually doing it just online feels really weird. And the funny thing is, I honestly can tell you, I have very little in common with anybody in the room. So it's not like I'm going there and making friends that I'm keeping in touch with. I mean, I live on the Upper West Side of New York City. I'm probably still, I'm happy to say, the youngest, one of the younger people in the room. <laughs> but you know, there is some commonality that I get. And when I'm in, I'm in the grocery store on Sunday night and somebody tells me about the 100 calorie flatbread that's saving their <laughs> life, I think, thank God I met so-and-so at my <laughs> meeting. There is just definitely something about the actual meeting that for me, it, it really keeps me much, there, there's no way I would do it just online. And I'm actually enjoying playing with my iPhone and doing the whole thing, but I really love the 
the actual going to it. And yeah. you know, when I lead, I never want to go. I always say I'm going to weigh in and I'm not going to stay for the meeting. That's what I tell myself on the way over always because I don't have time and I don't want to be away from my kids and I'm not going to sit through the meeting and listen you know, to somebody talk about the recipes and the tuna casserole, I just can't do it. You know, I don't have time for that. I'm a busy person. I love it. You had a two-point chicken. Have a great day. Um, but you know what? When I get there, I walk in, and I always feel good that I'm there, and I always wind up staying for the meeting. And even if it's a lecture that I've heard before or whatever, there's always something new I hear, and I always find that at the most craziest point in the week where I never would have thought that what I was absorbing was valuable, it comes into my mind, and it keeps me on track. And it's, it's really amazing. Um, what would be my advice? Well, that is interesting. I'll tell you something that I think about all the time in Weight Watchers, and again, I have not really studied your demographics, and because I sort of am a little bit older myself, and I do really do it physically, I, I use the online, but I really depend on the physical meetings. I often think, because I think Weight Watchers is so wonderful, how we bring this to a younger generation, like how do we make it cool? You know, how do you make it aspirational? Because the thing is, it actually is cool. And it's, sometimes I think it would be great if there was a meeting for just 30-somethings where we all went and talked about, you know, I ate at this restaurant last week and you ate at that restaurant last week. And I realize this is a small population and truthfully, you guys have 45,000 meetings a week and you're seeing a billion people and we're seeing, you know, 40,000 people a week or whatever we're seeing, we're talking about, you know, tens of thousands as compared to tens of millions. But I do think that there, that there really could be something about, you know, somehow in communities like New York City or Los Angeles or, you know, really vibrant young urban centers, you know, finding a couple of really young dynamic meeting leaders like Soul Cycle Stars, you know, in my personal meeting place, I actually love the older women that teach my meetings, but if there was some young guy that, you know, <laughs> no, 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 that really, you know, he was a lawyer, or worked on Wall Street or something, and he was doing this during the day and talking to me about my meeting at night, and I'm just saying, I do, <laughs> I, no, but I really do think that there is something that could be completely viral about bringing this to sort of a 20-something population in a way that is cool, that would so extend beyond just the people in those markets that you're hitting. I think all of a sudden you have many celebrities clamoring to be associated with the brand. I think that that in, turns, in, in turn inspires people in the middle of the country. And I just think that there could be something that takes this thing and, and, and says to young people, like, this is a cool thing. This is something you want to learn when you're 25 so that when you're 40 or when you're 35, you know how to lose your baby weight. You know how to keep yourself in shape. It's, it's a language that I'm going to learn earlier in life so that I can do that. And that's always what I think about when I'm in there because I just think it's so fantastic that, um, you know, people are always surprised when I tell them, like you said, that's what I do, you know. Even when I lived in Los Angeles, I used to drive over the hill to the valley. All my friends were getting the zone delivered at the time and whatever, <laughs> and I'd get in my car and go to the valley and sit in my meeting and then go, to, you know, to the Rock and Roll Ralphs on Sunset and buy my Weight Watcher stuff. <laughs> um, and I just really think, I think it's so fantastic that I just think that sharing it with younger people and having them start earlier would be, would be something that I always think about. That's great. It's so interesting to think about like kind of making it a point of pride in a, in a way, and, it, and how you do that and really build that is a really interesting challenge. I think um, having you guys talk to each other more would be fantastic. I want to open it up to questions from the audience to kind of get a sense. Oh, we have some questions right here, and while you're while you're all thinking, um, s thank you. So here's a question, and um, if anyone wants to raise their hand when I read it, so um, what are the key characteristics you look for when choosing leaders to join and inspire the members of your community? How do you inspire leaders to effectively lead? I'd actually love to hear that from both of you all, actually. So, do you want to chat about it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still thinking about what Julie was saying. <laughs> um, you know, I think we just try to provide, I think our goal is really to provide a platform where people can find an authentic voice. They can really like find a place that's like true and real so that when someone's teaching and they're really connected to a song, you can feel that and you can feel like they really love the song. That's why they're playing it. And I want to move to the beat of the music with them because 
they love what they are doing in this moment. And I, I'm actually, even if I only medium like this song, I love the fact that they're doing that so I could love it too. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, in terms of, of like how we get into inspiration, I mean, I, what, we, what we try to think about at Soul Cycle is, look, even if, the, if, if that's the energy of what's going on inside the instructor's training programs and, and, the, and the process that's getting set up there, like how does that happen for, for us everywhere in the company? And how do we set that tone? And how do we create an environment where you know, people get up and get excited to be a part of like a movement, be a part of something that delivers inspiration on a daily basis? And that's the kind of thing that gets us like humbled and excited to do. Like when we think about the structure of the company and you know, you have these pyramids of, you know, the CEO sits on top and then everything else is layers below. I mean, what we sort of to the point of I'm inspired by the song that you're playing and you're inspired by the song that I'm hearing, you know, we really try to think of things in more of a collaborative, yeah. um, you know, you've seen us work. Right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, well, it's you actually... know, it's more of like a galaxy than, you know, a pyramid, so to speak. And so I think that that what we try to do is have the microcosm reflect the macrocosm, yeah. and that I think is fun. Well, I think it's actually really interesting to think about the notion that what you're giving your leaders is the opportunity to be daily inspiring daily, which is actually, it's, I mean, how often do we all want that? You know, to kind of be inspiring daily, and so you're actually giving a really unique opportunity to the leaders. I'm curious for you, like, how do you think about it? You know, it's interesting. Well, the part of the answer is really straightforward, which is to be a Weight Watchers leader, you have to have gone through the program yourself and, and, and had success on it. And the reason for that is pretty obvious, which is if you don't know what it's like to deal with a weight issue, you don't understand. It's like it's a Weight Watchers mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you literally have to have, and, and by the way, what I tell people all the time is that, you know, the, the sad truth is, is that, and I'm one of these people, if you struggle with weight, it never really goes away. Okay, so if you struggle with weight, you'll always struggle with weight. In some respects, knowing that that's true actually is kind of a relief because no, you're not crazy. There's no 12-week cure for obesity. It just doesn't exist. Uh, I wish it did, believe me. I wish there was a magic pill that could make all this go away, but that's not gonna happen. You actually have to keep working at it because we're surrounded by all this junk and we kind of do all these things that we do. And so we have a tendency to beat ourselves up when we gain the weight back and all this kind of stuff. And if the person who's running that, that meeting doesn't get that, they're not going to connect. So the first, so that's why that's right. the crucial first requirement. Now, we have also done like, you know, lots of resources, everything else. We, we, we had, you know, we've had people come in and just do reams of research on what are the defining characteristics of a successful, is she extroverted? Is she like this? Is she like that? Is he like this? Is he like that? Trying to look at all these different characteristics. The very single one that is the most predictive of how effective you will be as a Weight Watchers leader is either you like to help people and you get off on it or you don't. And if you don't, that's okay. You don't have to. Like it's not everybody needs to be Mother Teresa. Like it just, it, that doesn't have to be your thing. But either you have that thing or you don't. And you can kind of figure out when you're talking to people whether they have that thing. So the, the experience plus a desire to help we have people, what's interesting is that in New York, like we tend to get a lot of Broadway folks, which I always find kind of fascinating. So we have a lot of theater people because for whatever reason it works out with their life and so there's, you know, we actually have kind of a funky eclectic group of leaders in, in New York City. Uh, but then other places they may feel like, and so they're very loud and expressive <laughs> as you would expect theater people to be. Uh, that might feel very different from another meeting you go to where she, you know, he or she is very quiet and sort of super sympathetic in someplace else where they're like doing a comedy routine, but they all like to help. Right. It's really interesting, the idea of like tuning your meetings towards your locale, which is actually, it's an interesting thing as you spread as well to kind of begin to think about how you do that. Um, you know, it's funny, I think about with SoulCycle, when I first came, people would say only in New York. It's so clearly not an only in New York phenomenon. And so how you tune what you do for your locale is going to be really interesting, I think, as you spread. 
We think about it all the time. Yeah. I mean, we think about it now. You know, what, what people want at 9.30 at night in Union Square is completely different than what somebody wants at 6 a.m. on East 83rd Street. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a really big piece of casting right. that goes on with that. You know, you really have to understand that even in one city, there are a hundred different audiences. Right. And, you know, as we program each slot, we're really super thoughtful about, you know, this is what somebody wants at this time of day and this type of person and... It, there's a lot of nuance that goes into making that schedule work. That's great. That's really cool. So I have a really different question um, it's a, um, from uh, someone in the audience, and uh, I'll throw it out, and then I'm curious just if somebody wants to raise their hand. But um, I work at a large um, area hospital. This is not me. It's somebody there. Um, it's a, we see lots of people whose unhealthy <coughs> lifestyle causes them to be repeat patients. How do we work with and engage these people to care about and participate in their health, especially when they don't want to? Um, I'm really curious. I mean, one of the things that you have is you have sort of voluntary systems, systems where people are kind of opting in. You know, they, they want to be there. If you were to think about what you kind of might learn from the things that you're doing and how that might apply to a system where people aren't opting in or you want to get them to, what are the things that you might consider providing? Anyone want to raise their hand on this one? Yeah. Thanks. I'll, I'll take a yep. crack at it because it happens to be a topic I think of a lot. I mean, the Weight Watchers for 50 years has been focused, if, if you, like, sometimes when I'm talking to healthcare people, like people that run big hospital systems and insurance companies, et cetera, and I'm trying to describe what we do, because they often have a hard time sort of conceptualizing what Weight Watchers is, I'll say, think of it this way, we run 600 obesity clinics nationwide. Uh, now, I would never use those words uh, in advertising, because it would make people really sad and depressed. Uh, but from a, from a medical perspective, that's kind of what it is. And usually when I say that, they say, okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. But now you kind of get into, and, and a lot of what we're focusing on right now is finding ways of making Weight Watchers much more directly connected in with the health system. Because if you actually, there's a clinical definition for what we do. This is kind of fun. The clinical definition of Weight Watchers is called community-based multi-component intensive behavioral therapy. <laughs> It really goes without saying that that's definitely not stuff we would use in our marketing materials, but that's actually the definition of what we do. Uh, and, and I have this conversation with healthcare folks all the time who are really frustrated with diabetes and heart disease and everything else and obesity, and they keep saying, why can't I get patients to do what I want them to do? Well, part of the issue is that doctors are not having the conversation as much as they should with patients. And then furthermore, it too often, in my view, becomes sort of laden with value judgments on you don't look right. And that's not the issue. And that's the, one of the biggest issues that I see with obesity is that it's been sort of relegated to the covers of lifestyle magazines about how celebrities look. And look, sometimes I'm part of this issue. But it is too much about how I look because honestly that's why people want to go. Like most people want to do Weight Watchers or lose weight because they want to look better. Yet the compelling reason to do it is because you're pre-diabetic. So you know today there are 26 million Americans who have type 2 diabetes. That's bad. That's double the percentage than was the case in 1970. But there's another 78 million people who are now classified as pre-diabetic which means they have A1Cs between five and a half and six and a half which means that over the next 10 to 15 years, by and large, they will become diabetic. And it literally has the potential of crushing the life out of our healthcare system because we can't afford it. But what's interesting is that when physicians, for example, start talking to their patients about numbers and conditions and things that aren't grounded in your value as a human being, but rather the fact that you have a condition that requires treatment, it creates an opportunity, I believe, for them to have a completely different dialogue, which gives the potential for treating obesity as a health condition, as opposed to purely as a how I look and how I feel about myself. Interesting. Do you have thoughts? I mean, we, we really do have a lot of thoughts about this. I think, you know, one of the things that we're Look, we just took, we took our first bikes and brought them to a couple of different locations of underserved communities to try to get people. I mean, for us, like we, we wanted it, 
it's kind of two things, right? You want to get like the, the kids who are big enough to use the equipment to get excited about music, to hear music and the beat. Like Julie always talks about training, how the instructors ride to the beat. Mm -hmm. And if we can just train people to start to think about music as beat, and if they hear beat, they just want to move. Mm -hmm. And so whenever they hear music or if they have a song in their head, they're just moving. Like we just feel like that could yeah. be a start, like a very small start, but a start. Um, you know, I think we're thinking about things along the lines of like a digital platform and what that can do. Um, look, I, I think that we haven't even we haven't even cracked open the can yeah. um, in terms of, of of what we can do. Sort of, you know, I, we do a lot of philanthropy at SoulCycle. We have always believed in that, and we all have always been committed to giving back to every community that we're in, neighborhood-wise. Um, but I, I do, I, I think, you know, and. <coughs> Talk to me in two years. Hopefully, yeah. we'll we'll have something a little bit better going. But it's it's really, it's terrifying what's going on out there, and to have people want to find some kind of joy in their lives that they want to move their body or they want to, you know, go for a walk or just feel that kind of like hope. Yeah. that's the thing that's so scary. It, it kind of reminds me of the way that you characterize Weight Watchers in the beginning as kind of being bilingual, and it's like and it's kind of like teaching a second language early. You know, so it's, I, I think there's something really interesting. This, this music is something that we it. talked about right when yeah. when I walked in and started stalking you um, <laughs> but that's the truth I you know and and you know you were saying it, it's tricky to try to put some sort of you know what what we discuss as a weight loss system and implement it into a school let's say but there's no reason that children should not be be taught in a way that's healthy and safe which Weight Watchers is it's absolutely I believe the way everybody should be eating it's the right amount of calories from all the different food groups. I mean, there is nothing, it's really only healthy if you're yeah. doing it the way you're supposed to do it. So at the end of the day, if there was a way to code it somehow that, you know, was positive and with self-esteem and love and teach it to our children early on, it seems like that's really the way to go. Yeah. You know, then the issue becomes, you know, where do children in, where do children in many neighborhoods right. find fresh fruits and vegetables? I mean, that's a whole well, other yeah. type of situation. You know, you, they have to have the food to implement these things, right. which unfortunately is half of the problem. Yeah. But, and to Elizabeth's point too, you know, music is such a gateway, especially, totally. you know, in certain urban communities. And, you know, if you really, if you use music as a gateway to exercise, you know, we always joke around and say, you know, it's like somebody, you know, slipping the spinach in your ice cream. And it really is. You know, that's what music does that. for people yeah. with yeah. exercise. Totally. So actually, on, on that point specifically, um, I had, the, uh, I had the, the pleasure of, right before I was here, uh, I was given, I was able to participate in a site tour of the Harlem Children's Zone, uh, which, which many of you uh, probably know what that is, which is this, this huge project organization where they've taken over a huge portion of, of Harlem starting with you know after school programs now they're running charter schools everything else and so i was sort of I, I got a tour of seeing all this stuff everywhere i went they had kids jumping around uh, they were exercising in classrooms they went over to they they run half of an armory uh, up in the the 130s uh, and there were just teams of children like playing tennis learning how to play golf they were doing gymnastics and just playing basketball and everywhere i looked I saw just unfettered joy. They were so happy. They were running around like little crazy people and just having the time of their life. And I, and I, and I was struck when I watched it and I, and, I, and I said, I said, you know, what was this like before these guys were here? Because they've had such a transforming effect on that community and they've opened it up to this place where it's like, it's like the heavens opened up and you sort of see these people experiencing this in this otherwise what would have been very depressed and they talked about in the early days having to sweep out the crack vials uh before the kids came into school that were littered on the sidewalk it was just bad and it's not to say that every problem in harlem has been fixed by any stretch but it's just it's very transformed and i think the thing about exercise is that when you talk to someone who doesn't exercise it feels intimidating and it feels a little bit like drudgery. When we, do, when we do consumer work, these are the types of words that we hear and it's just, it feels heavy, it's a burden, it's hard, it's whatever. When you talk to someone who has developed the exercise habit, like, I, and, and I became that person. I mean, I literally over a course of 10 years became an exercise everyday person. Uh, and I tell people all the time, I can't begin to express how grateful I am 
that I have become uh, a, a, a habitual exercise person. And my life is so massively enriched as a result of like stumbling into this. And it's not a personal discipline thing. At this point, like right. it's purely habit. Like I literally don't know what to do with myself, not because I'm being like militant, but more because it's so part of my routine, I don't know how to not do it anymore. And I'm incredibly grateful for it. And you know, and it's sort of like it's, and you see this with like people who are habitual soul cycle users, that they're just, they love it. It makes them feel good. And not only while they're doing it, but after they do it, because all of a sudden they're empowered. They're in control of their life. They are a person who exercises all the time. They feel strong, they're confident. So many wonderful things happen. And then you talk to someone who doesn't exercise at all, and you just, you so badly want them to get this habit. Yeah. And I think about this in the broader context of everything we're trying to achieve, because most people don't exercise regularly. It's not even kind of close. What we find is that people, like the sad truth of the world is people, like if they've done studies, that people tend to underestimate how much they eat by 30%. And they tend to overestimate how much they exercise by 30%. Uh, and yet when you find people that actually sort of find this elixir of life, particularly exercise, and it takes a while to get there. I mean, you don't do it overnight. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's amazing how transforming it is. But then we sort of like say, well, but why isn't everybody getting some of this? Okay. Yeah, so actually I love the idea of kind of music being a trigger. What are the things that are the triggers you could build really early in to the way that you think that actually kind of lead towards activity, which feels like there's a lot of potential around that. I actually do want to just open it up. If there's anyone who has a question in the audience who'd like to throw anything out, raise your hand. Anything? There we go. How do you feel about your experience and soul and everything? It's all about being personal and really touching, you know, everyone's, interactive in the actual studio, how do you feel soul will grow and sort of in integrate itself into such a big digital industry that we all live in? The app will be here very soon, thanks to our <laughs> friends at IDEO. Um, I just want to say that. Um, long, long time coming. I mean, I sort of, I think this sort of relates to, to the Weight Watchers. I don't know if this speaks to that at all, but it feels to me like you know, it's all about the breakthrough. You know, it's like, for me on the bike still, like Julie was saying this today, we, we rode in a class today, and it's just, we, we've been doing this for seven years. You know, you think you're, it's, you're on a stationary bike, you are not going anywhere. <laughs> and you think you are gonna get a little <laughs> bored. And the, for, me, for me personally, like the personal breakthroughs that I have on that bike that I have and that experience that I have connecting to the music that, I, the, I am in it for the breakthrough. Like it is awesome that I am doing some exercise that will be good for me so that I can still fit into my pants. I'm so up for that. But it is really, for me, it's like, it's just, it's about how I'm, I'm breaking through. And so I, when I think about, you know, the combination of technology and humanity, it's just, it's how we're all using this stuff for the right reasons and how we're using it to break through and, you know, get rid of the clutter. I mean, that's what happens for me in class. We always joke we should have, like, notepads. How many, like, great ideas have I had in there that I've lost once I walked out the door? But, I mean, I just think that that's where the potent intersection is. For us, anyway. For me. I don't know about you. Do you mean more specifically what's coming? I mean, we are at, working on that. Too. Yeah, we are actually getting ready for a whole um, revamp of our digital world. We've been yeah. busy, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's 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 running behind us. But that being said, uh, we have really spent with IDEO. We have spent several months sort of studying the habits of our riders, what our users really want, ways they want to interact with the brand more, the type of content they want to be able to take home with them after class. And so what you will see, and it will launch really within the next three months or so, 
we hope. Um, <laughs> I'm not involved. So um, it's <laughs> directly. So it's um, <laughs> no, what, what, what you'll see is everything from, you know, the instructors are going to have a much bigger presence. You'll really be able to interact with your favorite instructors' social media and get some of their, you know, playlists, their favorite songs of the month. You're going to be able to, you know, really, uh, there's an app coming and you'll be able to book easily and find out what classes you can still take in your day and so all that kind of than what stuff on now. the phone. Uh, the commerce is going to be completely different. Just there's going to be so much more information, so much more content, lots of video. Great music. You know, three touches are going to become one touch. And so, and that will just be a baseline for us beginning to really build off of this new platform where we hope that what will happen is, you know, when you sign up for your class, you can let, you know, Kate know that you signed up for Elizabeth's class and then I don't teach. Sh she can sign up. <laughs> But I would take your class. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, so you'll be able to share, you know, via, via technology, you know, who's taking what. Can, you know, you can send your friends that information. And then something else that we are really trying to do is because SoulCycle is, you know, at this point an experience that we're, we're just not sure that we're going to get to every town, everywhere, be it in every country or in the middle of this country, so one thing that we are really, really focused on doing is, you know, creating digital content that you will be able to stream to your iPad or whatever you're, you're using at the moment, and you can get your soul cycle and put it in your basement, and you can, you know, get your classes that will come to your bicycle, and either those will be live streaming or they will be something that's pre-recorded, but we are hoping that we'll be able to pretty soon use technology in that way so that people everywhere can sort of experience what's going on at SoulCycle. And what's slowing that down is we want it to happen to good music. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not surprisingly. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's actually... Uh, do, do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I was going uh, to... You know, what's interesting is that in, in those sort of... So right now, the, the buzzword for the, the answer to every question known to humanity this year is an app. <laughs> um, and, and it's sort of, it feels like we're in this place where like apps are going to like sort of like resolve and solve every issue that we face as human beings. Um, and it's on one hand, it is amazing and spectacular to see what, for example, having a computer in your pocket can allow you to do. And it can allow you to do some really cool stuff that doesn't make it the answer to every question. And my view of technology has always been that at its best, technology is about figuring out exactly what these guys just described that they're, do that they're doing, which is figuring out what people are trying to do and using technology to help make that easier and more engaging and more fun. But it is, it, it's sort of, it's, but that doesn't necessarily make it the answer to every question. So I think, when I think about this stuff is that, you know, I think ultimately, you know, what will be interesting with, with SoulCycle, and I get this question all the time, like, why don't we have virtual Weight Watchers meetings? Well, I mean, what's different for us is that we can afford to pretty much have a Weight Watchers meeting everywhere. Like, you, you, you'd have a hard time swinging a stick and not hitting a Weight Watchers meeting. <laughs> we run 20,000 a week uh, across the United States. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so as a result, there's pretty much one always close. So we don't really have the issue of people can't get to one. And it's, it would be, I could imagine sort of having a pretty good experience doing a soul cycle in my basement, having it stream, but I would still like, if I could like go five minutes and actually go to a soul cycle class, I guarantee you that's going to be much more inspiring. Uh, it just may be that the alternative is nothing. So therefore the thing that's the alternative to nothing is better. I guess my, my point is, is that with technology, it's, I think that the richness of what is going to be in the next, if you look at the, the, the future of like what's next, I think it's going to be those places that can find the right points of intersection of kind of human touch, community, group, things that actually happen face to face with technology as a powerful enabler of tasks and things that you're trying to do. And those people that can stitch those elements together I think are going to be huge winners. So like, for example, I was having a conversation with someone recently, which was everybody now is assuming that Best Buy is just going to die a horrible and painful death uh, at the hands of Amazon. But how many people know that if you go to Best Buy, they will actually come and install all this stuff in your place so that it doesn't look like hell 
when it actually gets installed because they will hide the wires and things like that and they'll make it all work. I, I think that those guys, like by embracing service and getting Geek Squad to work better and everything else, can create a different place for themselves that still that allows kind of this sort of human touch and this kind of real human interaction. And if they do that well, combining with technology, they're home free. And I think that what you're going to see with smart brands like SoulCycle is that they're going to be doing the same thing, using technology in a way that enhances and builds and drives the overall experience, but not sort of letting themselves be defined as we're only online or offline. Yeah. No, it's actually interesting when we when we were looking at disruptions in health and, and the reason we actually landed on community as opposed to thinking about technology specifically was that it felt to us that actually great technologies are actually enabling age-old behaviors in, in a lot of ways. So we always think about like farm to table. Farm to table wouldn't exist without social networks, right? Because it's like, how do you reach a farmer if it's actually not through kind of technology? So I think there's some really interesting things around the kind of back and forth that you provide that really still connects to the real experience and the, and the, and the, the real people community that I think is really powerful with what you're doing. I'm going to take one more question um, from the audience. And then just so you know, um, I think people can the panels can stay for a little bit to actually kind of mingle and we can chat afterwards. And if you have to run, we'll, we'll, we'll find uh, ways to connect. But uh, one more question. I think you had your hand up right here. Yeah. I'm always thinking, like, I have an idea in my head and it seems like it's, you know, you're doing it the next day. And I'm like, they're so in touch with us. How are they doing it? What types of consumer research do you guys do? And <laughs> um, it seems so seamless. And I'm, I mean, I am your consumer and I'm also thinking about it. I do check out while I'm actually spinning, but it's always going through my mind how seamless the experience seems, so I'm just curious. Interestingly enough, the way that we do market research is that we are the user of the product every day. And that's really, we really do no market research. Our market research is that we are a small team of people that are using our own product all day long, every day. Part of our hiring process at SoulCycle, you don't work at SoulCycle unless, <coughs> unless you ride at SoulCycle, unless you passionately ride at SoulCycle. So we have an office full of SoulCycle riders that are running in and out all day in sweaty workout clothes saying, oh, so-and-so was complaining about this at the Upper East Side. They don't like <laughs> that person in that time slot in NoHo. We need to change the towels in Union Square. I'm telling you, in the life of a day in SoulCycle, what we get just from our employees that are riding through the studios and from us riding through the studios, that is one of the things that we really ask of our employees and also of ourselves is that we all continue to work at the front desk. We try to get behind the front desk as often as possible. We always say what we learn at the front desk in one hour is more than we could learn in our own offices in one month. And that is true. You stand there for 60 minutes and watch the crowds come and go and just eavesdrop on a conversation in the locker room or, you know, or behind the desk. And if one person has something to say, you can be sure that 50 more people feel the same way. You just didn't overhear them saying it. And we take those things really seriously. If somebody, if we hear somebody, one person complain about something, we really give some thought to it. We'll sit down and say, you know, I heard today so-and-so was complaining about the new laundry detergent. Probably 100 people hate the way it smells. We better get a new laundry detergent. Or this needs to evolve. That's another thing also. You know, we are really aware of the fact that our customer is a loyal one. Our customer is coming to us four and five times a week. And guess what? Even with the best thing four and five times a week, you get bored at some point. So as soon as we think it's great, we go ahead and think we better start to change this now. Because what you did five times, 25 times last month, it could be boring to you on the 26th time, and we've got to offer you something else. So we keep in touch, and we keep moving, and that's really our, our market research. We don't really do polling or anything. It's just it's, it's a completely organic, internal animal that sort of just continues to feed itself. And, and, I, and to add to that, I think, you know, we also really believe in customer service, so we really listen. We have that web part, that web Losing web address, excuse me, that took a second. Um, <laughs> your soul matters, um, that you can email us. And I mean, we read everything. So, you know, if, if, 
as Julie said, you it's know. It's fascinating. We get to wrap up every week. Oh my God, it's our favorite It's, time it's our of favorite week. thing. We Love get this it. thing. It's, you know, we have a, a web address, your, you know, Your Soul Matters. It's like our Dear Abby, right? You can send, you know, you can send everything to us that you loved, that you hated, you know, and we get a section that's called Rants and Raves. So <laughs> we get raves first. I usually fast forward through those. I get right to the rants. Yeah. <laughs> and it's amazing. I mean, we get, a, we get pages full of rants and raves. I love this person. I hated this person. That was great. This was terrible. You know, now we even have them sort it so that they put in parentheses you know this rant was times two but this rave was times six because it's hard we see so many people now you know there's so many one-off comments but we really take them seriously I have to say that we really do we we take the time to really read them every week digest them we bring those topics back up in our weekly meetings we really process through them we work through the topics that we think are the most important and you know one other thing that I will say and it's not so much market research but it's one thing that I think that we're really good at actually we're really agile there's very little ego involved and when the ship is being steered in the wrong direction we turn it around quickly you know we really listen and then we really do implement change so I actually do want to throw this back to you because I think it's a you brought up something really interesting which <coughs> is that when you are and then then we'll end the conversation but when you are designing things that actually are community experiences actually kind of being close to those communities or actually being you know, your consumer actually helps you design for that. And I'm just curious, as you've gotten to scale, the, the scale you have, how do you stay in touch with the, um, the, your community as it's grown so broad? I mean, I'm really curious to see what, what you've, yeah, you've done. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Taking notes. <laughs> well, you know, you know what's, what's interesting is that um, listening to these two talk is that what you're listening to are entrepreneurs. This is how entrepreneurs actually communicate. They, they use these types of words, which is what makes them successful entrepreneurs. Uh, because they're, they're just, they're so immersed in this thing that they nurtured and created from scratch that they live it and they breathe it. And it's, it's significantly driven by intuition. You won't necessarily hear them sort of prattle on and on and on about like, you know, conjoint analysis and kind of all sorts of, of other things, which is much more typically the land, for example, if you work for a CPG, uh, like that's how you kind of talk if you work for Procter & Gamble. Um, Procter & Gamble, at its best, and they have been pioneers in this, they do a boatload of ethnographic research. What does that mean? They actually go and watch people use dishwashing detergent uh, or laundry detergent, and they actually study patterns, and this is another thing Charles actually gives, Charles Duhigg gives a great talk on Febreze which was kind of how they eventually learned how to market Febreze was not by doing focus groups, but rather by observing what people are doing on a very deep level. That's what these guys do naturally because they're literally living and breathing as consumers of their own product and living and breathing in their own ecosystem, and they're very close to the ground. I think the trick for anybody that works for a large company is that there's a lot of, you end up with a lot of pr uh, professional management, which is inevitable. Like, not everybody can be the founder of the company, and it gets big. Uh, and then the trick is, is that how do you create a culture of staying close? Uh, I feel like within, within my organization, there are times that I think we're doing it really well, and I think there are times that we're doing it less well. Uh, the times that we're doing it well is when our people are very much on the ground and interacting, and I, I say all the time, and I feel like I never spend as much time in our meetings as I want to spend in our meetings, because every time I do, like I always come away with like 10,000 ideas to the point that the people that I work with are terrified when I actually go out and spend a day out in the field because I come back with like 10,000 new things to work on, they're like, for crying out loud, we're trying to prioritize here. Uh, it, but I guess my point is, is that you have to work harder at a big organization to keep close to the ground. Uh, and I think that the smartest thing to do is listen to entrepreneurs like this talk about what they do, which they didn't do it by design. They just did it through intuition. They didn't know what else to do other than the thing that they're doing. I mean, it wasn't like a big decision. It was more kind of who they were and sort of what was important to them, which is what you'll get from an entrepreneur. The trick is, is to listen to what they're saying and then figure out how to apply it to your organization. That's great. 
Thanks. So I'm going to wrap it up here. I want to let you all have some time to if you have questions, but I am um, uh, informally. But I do want to sort of say it's funny that you kind of started by saying that you had kind of issues potentially with the word brand. And actually, even as I was thinking about kind of introducing you all, it was hard to think of you as brands or for that matter, actually businesses, I think, because in a sense, there is a really strong mission behind what you do. And so um, just it's fantastic to see you kind of share that mission. And I think actually I'm hoping that there'll be some kind of collaboration point between you three because it feels like there's total potential, at least a shirt that comes out. <coughs> <laughs> That'd be fantastic. So uh, we're looking forward to something like that. But I'd love to thank you and a round of applause for everybody on the panel.